now joins me Dr. Kent Fraser, a lecturer of international relations from Sin University. Welcome back, Dr. Kent Fraser. It's great to have you on the show. It's a pleasure to be back. Thank you very much. How is the situation right now, according to you, evolving in Afghanistan? The situation in Afghanistan is uncertain at the moment, but it is looking quite dangerous. The uh, uh, withdrawal of all the American support and many thousands, millions of people have been displaced. There are people trying to get across the borders because despite uh, the Taliban's assurances that there won't be any uh, purges or revenge killings, there are some reports but they seem to be, from what I can tell, fairly vague second-hand or third-hand reports uh, of summary violence, um, which is very disturbing. It makes it extremely difficult for anybody to provide aid for them, um, certainly from the West, and that means it makes it harder for us to have uh, influence over what they do. Um, the United Nations has been delivering quite a lot of economic aid. Well... That's an overstatement. I think they've delivered something in the order of 12 tonnes, I think, um, which is nothing really if for a country of 40 million people uh, facing uh, winter coming on, the collapse of their service provision services. I think it's safe to say that anybody who's been associated with the government in the last 20 years <laughs> is... Uh, going to be nervous at the very least and possibly in serious danger. So we're hearing, on the other hand, a lot of good stuff from the Taliban themselves. Um, they're promising not to do revenge killings and to look after women, and but there are restrictions already on women about uh, going out in public. Um, so it's, it's uncertain, but it's heading into a, possibly a very dangerous situation altogether. Winter coming with uh, disrupted supply lines for basic services and uh, a civil war or guerrilla warfare developing in the north. Uh, so it's, I'd have to say it's looking pretty grim. It could get better. Uh, the Taliban are interested in getting aid from China. So we'll see how that goes. Do you have any information that there are any public servants who served the previous government who are also now actually working for the new uh, government, for that matter, the Taliban? Well, I personally don't know about that, but the information I can glean from where I've looked, um, I think, uh, you know, the United Nations is saying that basic services have been severely interrupted and, uh, you know, collapsing as we speak, along with the economy. Um, so there will have to be significant amounts of aid, which is not just about money, it's about logistics and permission as well. You can have all the aid you want, but if the local uh, armed uh, faction, whoever's in control, won't let you take the aid to the people who need it, then you can't do it. It doesn't matter how much money you've got, you just can't do it. Um, so, so it's a very dangerous thing. Um, as I say, I don't have any direct information about public servants continuing their roles or not, except that there, there are reports coming from the United Nations suggesting that the whole system's collapsing in terms of service provision and looking out for people. And that suggests to me that uh, there aren't very many public servants left and I don't blame them. It is also very much in the Taliban's interest that they stay. Do you see any attempts to make them come back as soon as possible? And if so, how? Well, so far, uh, they've been reassuring them, essentially saying, we won't, we won't kill you if, we come, if you come back and work for us. Uh, however, that's a pretty difficult, you can only have to put yourself in the position of somebody who's worked with the occupying forces, not just the Americans, there are you know, all NATO members, several people, for armed forces have been there and they've all had networks of locals working for them, contractors, translators, uh, logistics people, you know, just functionaries in the system that keep a country going. Um, and I think 
again, you just have to put yourself in their position. Would you believe you'd be willing to put your life on the line that the Taliban are going to live up to their promises um, or the way they're talking? Maybe they will. But if I was, if it was me, I'd be erring on the side of caution. But the problem with that, of course, is it means all those, all those systems run by those people um, uh, potentially collapse. And that seems to be what's happening. If the United Nations is saying they've managed to get 12 tonnes of aid into a country of 40 million people, uh, you can see it doesn't sound very good. Winter's coming. And it's not a catchy tagline. Now, do you have any information if there are still any U.S. or other citizens um, stranded in Afghanistan right now? And do you know what governments, let's say Western governments, are trying to do to get them out? And do you think that might be possible in the next coming weeks? Or do you see there any limitations to actually get these people out of the country? Well, the limitation will be the Taliban, how they are operating the airport. Um, some assistance has been sent to them, I think, by the US, but I'm not sure, um, to help them run the airport, so to do air traffic control. They might have been from Qatar. I'd have to check that. Um, but they're going to help them to keep the airport in Kabul, the Hamid Karzai airport there, open. Um, so that relief flights and evacuation flights can uh, land and take off there. Currently, there's a limited amount happening because the Taliban are in control of the airport and they, are, you know, they're not specialists in um, international airport air traffic control. So you need specialists, especially if there's going to be um, what the United Nations is calling for, which is uh, an air bridge referring there. To, they'll be referring there to the 1948 air bridge uh, that operated into East Berlin when the Soviet Union shut down um, the supply lines through, West, through East Germany to Berlin. And the West mounted a huge operation to deliver um, supplies to keep West Berlin alive during that time. Uh, it went on for eight or nine months, I think. So that's what the United Nations is calling for. It depends on uh, A, donor countries being willing to run those very expensive operations and B, obviously the Taliban, if they don't have, if they're not willing to let people in to run the airport, um, it's going to be very difficult to get aid to them. So it seems to be a Hercules a task for the Taliban, but especially for the people and the suffering that they must go through right now. It's uh, really terrible uh, to hear. Can you say something about the possibilities of potential civil war in Afghanistan or guerrilla warfare? And can you maybe give us an example or make the difference between the two, if there is any? I would say guerrilla warfare has already started. They've been... Uh... The, the Taliban, I think, is moving up to uh, attempt to force entry into the Pancha Valley north of Kabul as the remaining um, uh, opposition forces are retreating there and setting up uh, defensive positions in what is an easily defensible valley, the Pancha Valley. It's where the Northern Alliance held out against the Taliban in the 1990s. We're gathering there under the leadership of Ahmed Shah Massoud, who is the son of uh, the similarly named Ahmed Shah Massoud, who was running the Northern Alliance. He was killed a couple of days before 9-11, uh, and the Northern Alliance was then uh, the agents of the US as they took over the country. And then uh, so... The Taliban, are, um, the enemies of the Taliban. So you've got to understand that this is a country that's been at war for 40 years. And it, for many people, it's just a way of life. And also it's a country that has always been riven by factional and tribal and religious um, divisions. And the warlordism has been a normal state of being for many people in Afghanistan for since they can remember, you know, as they've grown up. So it's very unlikely that any single force would be able to hold down uh, a unified 
uh, government or territorial holdings there. So I'd say there's every possibility for all kinds of intertribal, intercommunal, interfactional and sectarian violence. Um, but that's not to say it will happen. You never know, maybe the Taliban have reformed and they'll keep everybody um, under control. Let's hope so. Uh, because if that doesn't happen and that means aid can't get in, that means a very nasty time ahead for the people of Afghanistan. What it, does it mean for the US and in general international politics when now, especially as the US citizen, they look to Afghanistan and see you know, thousands of weaponry, millions of worth, billions of worth, in fact, now in the hands of their former enemies? Well, the Americans really have uh, only one hope, <laughs> and that's to redeem themselves from this situation. And uh, But you have to qualify that. Really, the only thing they can do is negotiate with the Taliban in such a way that they can provide aid to... Um, help the people but of course in doing that they'll be cooperating with the Taliban who they've been their blood enemies for a very long time so it seems unlikely that that's going to happen for a variety of reasons <clears throat> one of those reasons is that spokespeople for the Taliban spokesmen of course for the Taliban uh, have already been saying they'll be uh, having open arms to aid coming from China and presumably from Pakistan and from Russia as well. So if they can secure uh, enough aid and the, enough of the right kind of aid for infrastructure for uh, their, to maintain those arms so that, that high-tech, high-end American uh, war gear, the thing about it is it needs a lot of money just to keep it up. A helicopter can't go anywhere if it hasn't got a qualified pilot and, a, and some aviation fuel to run it. So they need money and they also need supplies of uh, ammunition and uh, etc uh, dozens of different things so the geopolitical implications are that china in, ends up with a friend in afghanistan that the us can't negotiate back in and they really are not in a political position now to um, attack you know to go in, in any kind of way militarily not because they wouldn't be able to, but because they just don't have the political capital to be able to do that. Um, they'd be, it'd be only them. No, it wouldn't be no NATO, no allies. Well, Australia probably, some allies would go with it. So that leaves Afghanistan mostly in the hands of Chinese and uh, the Russians, the Taliban acting as a, playing a balancing act between a puppet for them and uh, re using their aid to establish their... Uh, rule in a more um, solid way in the country so they're able to hold down uh, outbreaks of violence um, and maintain control over the countryside and that way they can give they be able to pay back loans to the Chinese and the Pakistanis and anybody else who's willing to provide and it just means that the Western Alliance has lost Afghanistan in that scenario but that's only one of several scenarios that might go. It might be that the Taliban uh, behaves perfectly well and ends up, you know, being recognised as the government, but that, that would take years to play out. So we don't really... At the moment, right now, it's a very dangerous, unstable uh, going into winter. Um, but if they can get through this year, next year or two, what happens after that is very much up in the air. Dr. Ken Fraser, it's always great to have your insight. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the opportunity. See you next time. Dr. Ken Fraser. <laughs>